We can go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's installment of the Huron Pines Connecting to Nature series. We're excited to spend the next 30 minutes learning with you. Um, here at Huron Pines, we work to conserve and enhance Northern Michigan's natural resources, uh, focused in three primary program areas, healthy water, protected places, and vibrant communities. Our staff implement projects from river restoration and green infrastructure to protecting special places forever and controlling invasive species populations. If you're not familiar with our work, we encourage you to get to know us. I'm Jen Clem, Huron Pines AmeriCorps, serving at Huron Pines as part of my VISTA service through Michigan Tech, where I'm pursuing my master's in applied ecology. Samantha Nellis of Huron Pines will be leading a great conversation today. And before we dive into that, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Please make use of the chat box to respond to questions. You'll see them bolded on the slides or to ask questions of your own today. We'll also have time set aside at the end for a full Q&A. Today we'll be using the polling function um, where you'll see a pop-up box to respond to. If you do experience any technical difficulties, Chris Ingle, our communications associate, is available in the chat by email or phone. We will also be recording this installment, so if you lose connection, you can watch later. And finally, I want to acknowledge the incredible funders who support the Huron Pines Education Program, the Great Lakes Fishery Trust, Consumers Energy Foundation, the U.S. Forest Service, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities through the Healthy Watersheds Consortium Program, the EPA Environmental Justice Collaborative Problem Solving Grant, and individual donors and supporters like you. And with that, I'm going to let Samantha introduce herself, and then we'll dive into this week's topic. Thanks, Jen. Um, hi, I'm Samantha Nellis. I'm a watershed project manager with Huron Pines. I work on a wide, wide range of topics from native plant restoration to water quality outreach and improvement projects. Awesome. So what are we going to be talking about today then? We are going to be talking about water. So we live in a region with bountiful freshwater resources, yet we are still inundated with news of water concerns like drinking water safety and record high lake levels in summer, algae blooms, and so on. Um, but we're also dependent upon and connected by water, right? It sustains us, uh, we use it for recreation, um, and we know that the way that we treat water will affect those downstream of us, um, including our neighbors, but also wild places and from the plants in our forests to microbes, microbes in the soil and fish in our rivers. So we wanted to start out today to um, ask people that are joining us um, what they do to protect our most precious resource. Yeah, and so we'll pop up a poll right now. Um, you guys, if you wanna go ahead and just answer that, you can do multiple responses. Um, but yeah, some of these are really awesome things that I wouldn't think about, like like you pick up pet waste to be polite, but you wouldn't normally think about it in terms of water. So I think that's really great. Yep, I think that's an important one. Um, we'll talk about later how that can be flushed right to our water bodies. Uh -huh. Right. Interesting. We're seeing a lot of really good responses. Um, it seems like most people um, use, uh, limit the use of lawn fertilizer, uh, use environmentally friendly cleaning products, and uh, can serve water at home, which is really, really good. With a few people doing the routine septic maintenance and washing vehicles on the lawn, um, and then about half the people picking up pet waste, that's really good. Yeah, and um, one rain barrel user, which is awesome. <laughs> Yes. So, which water topic are we going to be getting into? Because it's kind of kind of a big area to cover, hey? Right. <laughs> so, we are going to be talking about stormwater. So, this is a um, source of water pollution that might not be on our radar quite as much as the other ones that we just mentioned. 
Um, but stormwater is rainfall or snow melt that instead of soaking into the ground, runs over surfaces like parking lots or rooftops or even compacted soil like in our lawns. <clears throat> um, and this water ends up um, going into storm sewer systems usually. So have we always had stormwater or has it only been since humans have been here on the landscape? That's a good question. So we have always had stormwater, but not to the extent that we have it now. So to understand the um, how, why this is a leading cause of pollution now is um, to understand the scope of the landscape changes that have occurred. So this is a, this graphic depicts um, uh, the difference between an intact natural area and an ur urbanized landscape. So we can see right at the top, to dive into the numbers here, um, a decrease in evapotranspiration. So evapotranspiration is the combined water that's added to the atmosphere from evaporation from the soil uh, and other surfaces and transpiration from plants. So transpiration occurs when plants soak up water and they travel up to the above ground parts of the plant and exit um, as water vapor through pores in leaves and stems. Uh, so even more remarkable on this graphic, I think, is the change to infiltration or what water is able to soak into the ground. So this adds up to about a 70% decrease in infiltration in this scenario. <clears throat> Um, so we think of water entering the soil as a storage area. It's also a great filter uh, and it recharges our groundwater supplies. So all of this water that would have been um, evapotranspirating or infiltrating um, occurs as runoff now. So we see that change from 10% to 55%. And of course in northern Michigan we maybe don't have these heavily urbanized areas, but even in areas with um, just a few rooftops or um, driveways and roads, um, it still has a, a pretty big impact on this water cycle. It's a really big change. Um, but at the end of the day, right, it's still just rain, right? So what's, what's the problem with that? Right, it is just rain, but uh, water, often referred to as the universal solvent, is really good at picking up and dissolving things along the way. So it's picking up fertilizers and pesticides, detergents, road salts, and even pet waste. And as it picks up speed, it's really good at uh, carrying with it trash and oils and greases and sediments. Um, and this is all swept through our storm sewer systems um, and deposited into a uh, the nearest water body usually um, and less often into um, maybe retention basins or stormwater wetland type um, structures. <clears throat> Another um, concern is uh, that a lot of our municipalities have combined storm and sewer systems so when we get a lot of rain there can be an overflow uh, in these systems and the sewage actually mixed with stormwater and is then uh, just um, sent out through these systems. Uh, in, in places that don't have um, underground sewage systems, um, we usually have septics, we can have, which can have similar issues if those are overwhelmed, flooded, um, or faulty in any way. So sending sewage into the water body. Um, yet another issue we have is that this water gets a lot warmer than it used to. So it has warming up our rivers and creeks, uh, which is especially detrimental to aquatic life whose metabolism and reproduction is very closely linked to temperature. Finally, um, there's issues with speed. So it's picking up a lot more speed on these hard surfaces than it would in a vegetated landscape. Uh, so this can result in a lot more erosion um, can lead to infrastructure failure and flooding. So just to put it in perspective, this can be a really powerful force, which we've probably all seen some cases of, examples of. Um, one inch of rain on one acre parking lot weighs over 100 tons. So it can 
um, move a lot of material and can, uh, you know, do some damage. So um, from there, I guess we were going to ask everyone joining us today is whether or not you know where your water goes when it leaves your yard. And you can add your comments into the chat box. Um, I know for me, it's actually pretty simple on a, a smaller scale because my water leaves the yard and goes through a ditch system and um, empties into a nearby inland lake. But I know for a lot of people, uh, it's less clear because these systems are underground in a lot of towns. Yeah, and we're seeing um, a couple of people know, uh, so some going directly to Lake Huron or into nearby rivers, uh, five lakes, um, into a ditch. Yeah, so some good information. I know where I'm at, I have no idea where the storm drains even are or anything just living in town and it's pretty much um, all concrete and asphalt. But yeah, it seems like a lot of people actually know which rivers their water is going to, which is really cool. Yeah, that is impressive. I'm actually by Five Lakes too. We might be neighbors. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyways, um, I'm impressed that everyone has an idea of where theirs um, is headed. Um, and kind of no matter where it heads on a smaller scale, we know that in Michigan, um, no matter where you are, you're in a Great Lakes watershed. So all of our water eventually is making it to one of these Great Lakes. Um, for those of us, and most of us, I would assume on the um, webinar are in Northeast Michigan, all of our water will drain to Lake Huron. So um, yeah, the health of that lake depends on, on everything that happens upstream of, of you know, the lake shore. A really impactful image too. So is there anything that we actually can do about it or are we just kind of, is it a lost cause because you've gone the industrial route? Yeah, so like we said, you know, the stormwater infrastructure that's in place in a lot of towns and um, even some rural areas like the sewer systems and ditching and um, basins and things like that have been designed to get water off the land as soon as possible, but they can't always keep up with the rate of development. So what um, people are trying to do in Michigan and throughout the world is to install green infrastructure. So green infrastructure attempts to mimic and restore these natural processes to improve the quality of stormwater runoff and increase infiltration. Um, and basically why we want to slow down the water and keep it out of the storm drains. So we're essentially reversing some of the urbanization in strategic places to capture the most um, runoff as possible. So here's a list of some examples of green infrastructure. So essentially they'll all use some aspect of green infrastructure um, using vegetation, soil, or topography to manage stormwater and create healthier urban environments. So in addition, they're actually cheaper than a lot of other conventional infrastructure techniques, um, especially in the long run, and can be aesthetically pleasing um, and add needed green space to more urban landscapes and build community vibrancy and strengthen people's connection to nature. So a few of these, uh, a couple of these require some engineering knowledge, but most of them can be uh, installed by anyone on their own property or um, within their communities. I did wanna dive into a couple specific examples of green infrastructure. Uh, the first one is a rain garden. So Rain gardens are one of the most common stormwater solutions that we see, and they're very versatile. They can be installed um, in a lot of places, uh, in cities, in commercial lots, in residential areas. Uh, they're essentially just a shallow depression in the soil that's meant uh, to capture runoff from 
rooftops or parking lots or sidewalks. Um, and so they're placing these strategic um, areas uh, to capture this water. Um, and then we plant them with deep rooted plants that can soak up and filter some of the stormwater as well as it slowly infiltrates into the ground. <clears throat> and certainly gorgeous too. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's kind of a, you, people think of rain gardens as these lush, vibrant um, wildlife uh, attracting wildflower gardens, but they really can have a lot of different looks to them. Um, so we do recommend using native plants for all of the reasons that you laid out in a previous webinar, Jen. Um, and, and they're great here, but they can have that kind of wild look or they can take on a more manicured, uh, you know, conventional landscape look like at the one in the upper left. Uh, they might also just have sedges um, and a couple shrubs like the one on the bottom. Um, it is important that the plants in the center of the rain garden are able to handle some intermittent flooding because uh, with a heavy rain, you, you will have cooling as that slowly soaks into the, um, into the ground. The other one I wanted to mention, which it sounds like someone on the webinar already has one, is a rain barrel. So this is a storage solution that captures roof runoff um, and keeps that water out of storm sewer systems. And then you have that water later on for drier times for watering your plants and your gardens and your lawn even. So um, they can be pretty handy. Uh, they do kind of get a bad rap sometimes because uh, They've been known to be mosquito breeding grounds in certain areas, uh, but there are some good models that you can buy that have appropriate, um, you know, mesh covers that can keep the mosquitoes out. And with some general routine maintenance, um, they're pretty easy. You know, you have to empty them out once in a while. You might want to scrub them out once in a while. Um, but other than that, they can be a really helpful addition to your home and your community. And one example of a really successful rain barrel campaign um, is in Portland, Oregon. So they actually installed 26,000 of these throughout residences uh, in the city. And they estimate that 1.2 billion gallons of stormwater gets diverted from the storm sewer system every year, uh, which has really helped them reduce the um, instances of their combined sewer overflows. So, but I think the message there is whether it's rain barrels or rain gardens, having many of these small scale uh, solutions across a larger landscape can have a really big effect. Now, can you put rain barrels anywhere in Michigan? That or? you can do. What's that? Can you put rain oh. barrels anywhere in Michigan or? As far as I know, um, I don't know of any local restrictions on rain barrels. Um, some states do have those, but I've not heard of any in Michigan. Okay. So um, as with any pollution, the best thing you can do is prevent those pollutants from getting into the system in the first place. So some ways that you can do this is through smart lawn care, you know, reducing the amount of fertilizers or pesticides you use on your lawn, letting your grass grow a little bit longer to slow down that water. Um, and um, if you happen to spill something on your property, uh, wiping it up or soaking it up rather than hosing it down the drain type of thing. Uh, for our waterfront, um, property owners installing a green belt in uh, by a water body um, is a really great kind of last defense for reducing erosion and um, improving water quality right before it hits the uh, lake or river. Of course, considering some of the other solutions we talked about today and then 
uh, staying tuned for volunteer opportunities in your area. I know Hero Pines and other partners are working on um, bringing some events and workshops um, around Northern Michigan. So, like we said, we live in an area of abundant water, and um, I will say we haven't experienced urbanization and development like other parts of our state or the country, and so we're in pretty good shape. So while there are certain areas um, in the region that need some immediate action, a lot of this work is proactive to ensure that we have clean water in the future. Um, and just by being mindful of what you put down the drain and possibly incorporating some of these green infrastructure techniques, um, we can protect our water resources in the long term. So it's kind of a final question um, after we've gone through this. Um, feels so quick, but uh, does anyone have any thoughts or see any possibilities for incorporating green infrastructure on your property or within your community? I know, um, I'm excited. I, I can't wait eventually down the road when I'm a little more settled to be putting in rain gardens everywhere, pretty much yeah. gardens everywhere, but. <laughs> um, I see someone in the chat box asked if we have specific types of plants with good root systems. Um, I think there are a lot of um, native plants and especially those wetland plants that um, do really well in rain gardens and we could send out a, a link or a PDF um, to that unless you have one, something like that um, to all of our viewers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, if you aren't pre-registered for it, you can feel free to email Chris um, and he can get you, or message Chris and he can get you those, um, those materials too that we send out after every talk. Yeah, and so um, a lot of, some of those um, more permeable pavements and greenways along trail systems would be great to see. So. And then did we have an activity for this week? Yeah. Okay. So the activity um, for this spring or summer, uh, we suggest grabbing your umbrella or your rain poncho and heading outside so you can look and see where your runoff is going, um, potentially where it's pooling around your home. Um, maybe there's an obvious spot for a rain garden or um, improved vegetation for reducing erosion. Um, so just to get to know the hydrology um, in your neck of the woods and get outside. Yeah. Yeah, and that seems great. And I think most of us tend to like hunker down indoors when it rains. And so we don't necessarily think about going out and seeing where that water is actually heading, but that's a really um, a great thing to do. Okay, so thank you for that great activity idea because I can't wait to get out there probably without a poncho. But <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so if you guys are looking for other ways to get outside, this um, season, be sure to check out the Stay Connected to Nature page at huronpines.org. And then that wraps up our content for today. So we appreciate everyone for joining us. And then I have a few wrap up items and then we have time for questions. Um, so as a part of our efforts to understand how we can continue to improve education programming, we'd appreciate a couple minutes of your time to fill out an evaluation survey. Um, Chris has put the link in the chat box. Uh, and then we have an overview document that highlights the primary information that we covered today, as well as some additional resources, um, which will be sent to everyone who pre-registered with Chris. And if you didn't pre-register, feel free to email him, uh, chris at huronpines.org, and he will get you that information. And then I'm really excited to have you join us next Thursday at 1 p.m., where we'll be talking about the birds in our backyard with Abby Urtel. 
And so let's go ahead and dive into some of those questions that we had coming in. Okay, so um, we did kind of cover the plants with good root systems. Um, and that, let's see, um, do, does Huron Pines do on-site visits for rain gardens or anything like that? Or do you know of anyone that, anyone that you'd recommend in the area? We have, are historically able to do site visits um, for um, different issues. Uh, our capacity right now is a little limited with current restrictions, but mm -hmm. um, one thing I would recommend um, is looking through some of these materials we're sending out um, that can kind of give you an idea of whether or not the site is suitable for a rain garden. So you can uh, do an infiltration test. Uh, I know, you know, if you're in an area where the water table is quite high and the soils are saturated a lot of the time, a lot of these infiltration techniques aren't very applicable because you'd essentially make a depression and it would just fill up with water. Um, so doing some of those initial tests to see uh, how your drainage is and how deep your water table is, um, is, a, is really great. Um, and seeing where, it also has guidelines to see where you could put it and, um, and how big it would need to be to manage the amount of water that's running off from you know, your roof or driveway or whatever it might be. So I would suggest that first um, and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you um, need more guidance. Okay, um, and then what does maintenance look like for permeable pavements? Is it pretty intense or? Um, there's kind of a there's various maintenance. So um, it, it depends a lot on the surrounding uh, area and uh, the biggest issue with permeable pavements is that over time it'll fill up with silt and sediments and things. Uh, so there are actually ways to kind of vacuum that back out. Um, so, but that, and that really the, how long it takes for the pores to fill up um, is really dependent on a lot of different factors. But uh, I've seen, you know, every five to years or so, um, some of them will do that. Uh, there's been some really promising uh, cases of permeable pavement in Michigan now. Um, I know I was pretty skeptical at first that they wouldn't be able to withstand all of the freeze and thaw cycles, um, but there's some really great products out there now and uh, some permeable pavement going in in Alpena here soon, so um, I'm excited to, to see that put in. Great. Um, and then uh, Judd asked, do you recommend retention ponds to keep storm sewers from flowing directly into a lake or stream? And are there any sizing guidelines for those? Um, sure. Sometimes it's uh, beneficial uh, to have retention pond that can um, act as a either a settling area or a filtration area, depending on the vegetation that's uh, there, um, can be really beneficial. Um, I don't know off of the top of my head, uh, sizing guidelines, you know, depends on the area that is draining to that site and volume of water, so um, rainfall. I don't, I don't know exactly the gallons to um, retention pond size off the top of my head. I do know that the EPA on their website has a couple really great um, PDFs that go over uh, both detention and retention ponds and kind of pros and cons of them. Um, so it might be worth uh, looking at their site to get more details. Okay, great. Um, and then do you have any, any plants that you've seen in rain gardens that have worked well or didn't work well? Um, yeah, a lot of our native wildflowers, um, uh, like Joe Pie weed and some similar wetland um, plants. Um, and then uh, kind of up from there, I've seen some um, 
Penstemon, Digitalis go kind of wild in some rain gardens and Black Eyed Susans and um, yeah, I mean, it, it just depends. I've also seen some shadier ones where Columbine has done really well. So um, yeah, depending on the site, but uh, especially those plants that like to get their feet wet um, can really thrive in these spots. Okay, great. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that it is 1.30, so if anyone does have any time commitments, feel free to get off. And um, we do have that evaluation if you wouldn't mind taking a little bit of time to fill it out. But um, otherwise, uh, Samantha and I can stay on in the chat for a little bit and keep answering questions. Um, so we do have another question uh, from Abby. Do you recommend that I buy a rain barrel or can I make my own? Um, they're both good options and uh, you might be able to save some money by making your own uh, because the pieces that are required are common hardware store items. Uh, so as long as you follow kind of a do-it-yourself guide that has that mosquito um, netting on there, then I think doing it yourself is a great option. Great. Um. And with the mosquito netting, do you just put it on top of the rain barrel or? Yeah, it? usually it's just at the, the top um, covering that opening. Um, sometimes we'll put it at the bottom as well in case um, they're able to get in through that downspout. Um, I've seen people double up on it as well that are really worried and we'll put it um, you know, in multiple places. But yeah, and that that inlet right by where your downspout would come in would be the most important place. Okay, great. Hmm. And then we do have some extra videos. Um, resources for anyone that's still hanging on in the chat. Um, oh, and apparently there's a, um, Chris mentioned that there's a terraced rain garden on 9th Avenue Bridge in Alpena. Um, so that sounds really exciting if you're ever that way. That's great. I, I've heard that it's there. I haven't visited it yet. So check it out. <laughs> Yeah, um, and if you guys do want any of those extra materials, feel free to message Chris um, and he can get those to you. So I think we're kind of all out of questions for now. So we will probably end, but thank you guys all for joining us. Um, and then feel free to tune in next week at 1 p.m. where we're going to be talking about all things birds. So thank you so much, Samantha, for that awesome content. I'm I'm excited. I kind of want to make a rain barrel now. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you, Jen.